Uh, welcome everyone to the first of four student speech um, webinars. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more uh, later about what the four webinars are, but this first one is about uh, teaching Tinker and we are so, so lucky to have Mary Beth Tinker here with us today. Hello everyone, um, it's so good to be here with all of you. <laughs> Thanks Mary Beth. Um, so we are recording and this recording will be available. Uh, it should be available, I think, 24 to 48 hours afterwards. We'll post it on our social media channels. You can also find it on our YouTube channel. This is our agenda for our time together. This webinar uh, goes for two hours. Stay for as long as you are able to stay for. Um, so we'll start with uh, a, a welcome overview, introductions about who's here. Uh, then we'll take some time a uh, brief time to go over the facts of the Tinker case. Not too long because we want to dedicate a good portion of the first half of our of our time together um, as a Q&A with Mary Beth. Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to, in the second hour, talk about some different ways that you can teach uh, the Tinker case. Um, and, and then we'll wrap things up and give you a heads up about what the next uh, couple webinars are gonna be like, next few webinars. So to participate in this webinar today, um, there are a few different ways that you can do that. Uh, first of all, the chat is turned on and the chat um, is turned on so that you can communicate with us and you can communicate with each other. So that's just a heads up that when you use that two drop down panel, if you wanna talk to other teachers who are here, um, then please do. We One of the reasons why we uh, left that feature open is because we want you to be able to share resources and ideas and questions that you have with other teachers and, and have kind of a back channel communication with one another. The other way that you can participate in this webinar is through uh, the Q&A feature. So if you go down to the black toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see Q&A and you click that. You can leave questions throughout the webinar we're gonna use the Q&A um, twice. And so in the first half of the webinar, any questions that you would like to leave for Mary Beth um, should happen in, in the first hour. In the second hour, we're gonna focus more on questions related to teaching Tinker. Um, so that, that'll sort of give you a, a heads up about how we're gonna use the Q&A. You can, in the Q&A, take a look at what other questions people have asked and upvote questions. So take a moment if you decide that you want to use the Q&A to very quickly look through what other questions have been submitted before you add the same question if possible. And uh, if, if you wanna take a moment right now to introduce yourself um, in the chat, make sure that you click to all panelists and attendees when you introduce yourself, unless you just want to introduce yourself to us. Um, and let us know who you are, where you're from, what you're teaching, and anything else that you'd like to let us know about. And while you do that, we will introduce ourselves. My name is Jen Wheeler. Uh, I am part of Street Law's Teacher Professional Development and Curriculum team. Uh, and I'll throw it over to my colleague, Kathy, who will introduce herself. I'm Kathy Ruffing. I'm the other half of the teacher professional development team. Um, I recently retired from 27 years of teaching public high school in Fairfax County, Virginia. So shout out to my Fairfax County peeps if you're here. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. And we're also joined by uh, our colleague, Ben Marks. Ben is uh, here to help with any technical issues that you might have or, or kind of behind the scenes tech questions. So if you have a question for Ben, you should be able to direct chat him um, or you can just submit it into the all panelists um, and, and he can help you in whatever way he, he might need to. Just a little bit about street law, just in case you don't know anything about us. Um, street law has been around for almost 50 years. Uh, and we are an organization that develops programs and curricula to teach young people about the law and how to use it as a positive force in their lives. We do work in five areas, teacher professional development, which is probably why you're here, uh, legal community partnerships, legal life skills, global law and democracy programs, and curricula and teaching materials, which is probably also why you're here. If you're curious about any of those other programs, you can always visit our website, or even if you're curious about the stuff that you, um, about teacher professional development and, and the career. So uh, pleased to welcome with us, uh, Mary Beth Tinker. Uh, this slide shares a little bit more about who Mary Beth is. 
things that you might not have known. I did not know, uh, Mary Beth, that you were active in DC local politics, that you're a retired pediatric nurse. Um, if you'd like to take yourself off mute and, and share with us just a little bit more about yourself, maybe something that we didn't capture in, in your introduction slide. Yes, hello everyone. It's so wonderful and I'm just reading in the chat where everybody is from and all the different kinds of work you're doing. It's just wonderful. We are kindred spirits. We're all in this together. It's been such a crazy time for kids and teachers and all of us who care about kids and teachers. So I'm so glad to be with all of you and if there's anything I can I do to, you know, may, I'm going to try to you know, keep it kind of light and interesting because um, some of the professors and teachers I've been talking to said, you know, they're, they've invited me because they want their, their students to have a break, to just do something kind of fun and kind of easy that they don't have to study a lot for. So we'll just kind of keep it easy. I know everybody's stressed enough. So yeah, I'm so glad to be with all of you and uh, we're gonna have a good, interesting discussion. Thanks to Kathy and, and Jen too. I, they put so much work into this, it's really great. Glad you're here. Thanks very much. So this uh, gives you a little bit of uh, an overview of what this series is all about, not just today's session, but the entirety of the four session series. Uh, so as a result of, of, of participating in, in these four sessions, teachers who attend the sessions, um, the teacher facing sessions, will be able to use student centered strategies to teach about the Tinker case and to teach about an upcoming case that we're going to have resources for very soon called Mahanoy Area School District VBL. Kathy's going to talk a little bit more about that case later. A uh, really exciting case. I think maybe one of the most exciting SCOTUS in the classroom cases we've had in, in the last few years. Um, and I think one of the things that we're especially, especially excited about with that case is that we think that it will fit really well with both high school uh, students, but also with middle school students. A lot of middle school students study the Tinker case, um, and, and Mahanoy is, is a good addition to that. Um, and then, uh, of course, teachers who uh, attend both of these sessions hopefully can support their students in drawing connections between the Tinker case of the past and the Mahanoy case of the present. And we also have two student-facing webinars that we're going to be offering, one that's next week, and then one that's on the last Wednesday of March. And students who attend those webinars, those webinars are an hour long, um, will be able to understand the facts of the case, the constitutional issue, the precedents, the arguments that are in both of these cases, and also draw connections themselves between these two cases. Um, one of the reasons why we set up the webinar series the way that we did was we wanted teachers to have the opportunity to show up to this webinar learn some strategies for how they might teach about Tinker, talk to their students about it over the next week if the opportunity presents itself, and then next Wednesday, send your students to the Tinker webinar so that they are equipped with some information, they'll learn some more, they'll get a chance to ask questions to Mary Beth and have a Q&A just like you will. And the same will happen with Mahanoy. Um, I don't know that we have secured our guest expert yet, though Kathy might have more information on that. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy, who's going to talk a bit about the facts of the case. Great. Thanks, Jen. And actually, Mary Beth is going to do most of the talking about uh, the facts of the case. But I will start us off with the constitutional underpinnings, which is where we always start when we look at cases. And I'm sure you do in your classroom as well. So, of course, this case is a First Amendment case. We all know that. Um, and the, the famous words from the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Um, but of course that says Congress, and it wasn't Congress that was trying to um, abridge the speech of these students. So we're going to make that connection for you in just a moment. Uh, Mary Beth was not the first case about speech and student rights in classes. Um, before her case, there was the case of West, um, West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett. And this was a case about the flag salute. And I loved to show this picture to my students when I was in the classroom, because um, it's not a salute like we do, like you do in your classrooms today with the hand over the heart in 1943, when this case was brought, um, it looked an awful lot of like something that Hitler made famous in Germany, which is why the change eventually. Um, but Jehovah's Witnesses were made to say the Pledge of Allegiance, um, and this ended up being a freedom of religion case because also in the First Amendment, 
because it had to do um, with our religious beliefs not to um, not to pledge allegiance to anything but God. Uh, but it was also a freedom of speech case, although it was actually a freedom not to speak. It was a freedom to be able to not have to recite and stand and pledge. Um, this case was a, a reversal of a decision just two years earlier, the Gobitis case, in which um, the same basic facts were presented to the court and they found exactly the opposite way. And the fallout from that case was so horrible and Jehovah's Witnesses were so persecuted in that community that it, it, they quickly followed up by accepting this other case and essentially reversing their decision, giving students freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Um, and so today in your own classrooms, and I'm sure you're aware of this, students cannot be made to stand or recite the pledge as long as they're not causing a disruption, um, which is part, a lot of what we'll talk about today. So um, we, I mentioned before the Congress part in the First Amendment is really important. So the 14th Amendment is going to be really important um, to both that case that we just talked about, West Virginia v. Barnett, and the Tinker v. Des Moines case because the, the 14th Amendment has two aspects that are important to this case. One, the fact that it says that no state can abridge the privileges and, or immunities or deprive people of their, life's, their life, liberty, and property. So it also says that agents of the state, which of course you know you are as a public school teacher, um, are also uh, obligated to follow the rights given to you in the, in the Bill of Rights. Um, but it also becomes a, a, a equal protection issue because it be, it's whether students have retained the rights that people outside of the school have. Um, so we'll look at all of those things and Mary Beth in her um, discussion of the facts and her answers will um, address a lot of those things again. So one of the questions in this case becomes, are armband speech? So um, the First Amendment you saw, the words are very simple, just abridging the freedom of speech. So was the wearing of the armband speech? And I thought we'd start out um, by asking Mary Beth, um, what were you and your brother and your friends saying? What was the speech in the wearing of the armbands? message of the armbands, we didn't have those little peace signs on, but at the time was to mourn the dead in Vietnam on both sides of the war. And that was one thing that made it very controversial. And also to support a Christmas truce that was being proposed by Senator Robert Kennedy. So the 14th Amendment was very much involved and also, and of course the First Amendment, but the 14th Amendment because the school had allowed um, black armbands to be worn by other students to mourn the death of school spirit. So it became a very, an, an issue of viewpoint discrimination as well. But yes, that was our message, those two points. And then we, well, we were, had been, oh, well, I had been inspired and the other kids too. There was various, you know, levels of the reasons why we were the army. Those were our two messages. That was our two messages. But the, what brought each of us students to the point, five students were suspended. There had been 50 students signed up to wear the armbands until the principals heard about the plan and made a rule against black armbands. So then it dropped way down, but to less than 10 kids who, probably wore the, we think, wore the armbands out of around 18,000 students in that Des Moines, Iowa school district. But um, so we came to the point from different places. Some of the high school kids at Roosevelt High School is where it was planned in Des Moines, <clears throat> mostly. They knew about the war and they had been following it. They were very much against the war. I, we were, I was against the war too, but I was in eighth grade. I was a lot younger. I was one of the youngest, well, except for my sister Hope, who was in fifth grade, who also wore an armband. My brother Paul, who was in second grade, who also wore an armband, but they weren't suspended. But um, what one thing that had inspired me was knowing about these kids in Birmingham in 1963. I was 10 years old when, yeah, they marched. Around 2,000 kids were arrested that year in Birmingham. And all of the rights of public school students, um, really, they're so, it's so linked to the, the, the fight that young people, Black students, did their efforts to um, you know, stand up against racism. Because when those four little girls were killed in Birmingham in 1963, when I had just turned 11 years old, September 15th, <clears throat> um, a call went out by James Baldwin all to, for people all over the country to wear black armbands. 
and to mourn for the little girls who were about the same ages as me and my sisters. And we were very sad about that, those girls when we heard what had happened. And so there was a, an effort around the country to have these memorial services that were held. And we had one in Des Moines, and that was me wearing the armband. Um, go back once, uh, yeah, in the middle is me, and then on my, my sister Bonnie and Hope are there, and then our friends Linda and Phyllis, their mother had already won a lawsuit in the Iowa Supreme Court for the right to be served at a restaurant. She was a veteran, and she wasn't allowed to eat at a restaurant and, or at a drugstore in Des Moines, so she had already won. So that's how I was raised, by people like that. Our two mothers were friends. They got to be friends. My mom was from the South and she, they, my mother and father basically were just following their religion because they were very strong people of faith. My dad was a Methodist minister and my mother had been raised in the church as well. So they believed it wasn't right to treat people a certain way and that you couldn't just preach about it in church. You had to live it in your life. It was called the social gospel and it still is. So that's how we were raised. Was this the first time you wore armbands then? Yes, the yes, that was our first experience with black armbands. So it, we were saying that that time that we were sad. It's really a story. I like to talk to kids about how it's a story. To, and te when you teach it to kids, you can talk about how, you know, you have a lot of feelings because kids have a lot of feelings right now. And I'm really keyed into that because they're so precarious. I'm a nurse uh, with children and I've been a trauma nurse with kids and teenagers. So I'm very concerned about the social and emotional well-being of young people these days. So I teach it also as an example of how, you know, kids have a lot of feelings. And that's a strong thing about kids. That's one of kids' superpowers or whatever. And, and so they want to express that. And it really is good for them too, to express things that they feel. It helps their health. It helps everything. It even helps society. So that's what we did. We expressed our sadness with those black armbands. And then the next year was also an amazing year for young people standing up. That was Freedom Summer. And they were, oh my God, what a story. Um, Ella Baker and Robert Moses called people to Mississippi that summer as part of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I know a lot of you know all these stories, but this is was so important to the rights of kids, these young people, because when they... Um, met in Ohio to train. Hello, Ohio people. I see you're out there. I love to go to Ohio a lot. I'm a real Midwesterner. But anyway, so they trained at uh, Oxford at Western College for Women, 1964, the summer. And then they went because, you know, there was like 3%, 4% of African-Americans registered to vote. All this was about voting rights, actually. So much of the rights of kids is based on the struggle for voting rights for African-American people. So anyway, they went to Mississippi, Three were immediately murdered by the Ku Klux Klan. Cheney, Ben, James Cheney, James Cheney, Mickey Schwarner, and Andrew Goodman. And there's a movie called Mississippi Burning, which is not a core, really totally accurate. But anyway, so that had a big effect, not only on me, but on the country, because let's see, what's the next slide? Next, please. Um, what happened was, well, yeah, the same day that the bodies were found was August 4th, 1964. Two important things happened. One for the country and the world, which was that the same day, August 4th, off the Gulf of Tonkin in Vietnam, a US Navy ship claimed it was attacked and it hadn't been attacked. That didn't stop the US Congress from voting almost unanimously to then send thousands more troops to Vietnam. And they were already in the war, but it was kind of under the radar. So that happened. And my parents decided to go to, um, to Mississippi for Freedom Summer that year when I was, I, I, they came home on my 12th birthday and told me what had happened. And we knew we followed what was going on in Mississippi and how these young people had been killed. In so anyway, so um, Ben, a lot happened in 1965 as well, as you know, all of you in these mighty times that I think are so much like today. There's so many, you know, things to bring up in conversation for students and to make this relevant to their lives today. Because like, does anything in this remind you all of things going on today? You know, or, you know, we can talk about current events too. But anyway, so by Christmas, well, we had, there was a Selma, Watts, um, Malcolm X was killed in 1965. All this was going on. The Vietnam War was building up by Christmas time. That's me and my two sisters. I'm in the middle. Um, my dad would read to us from the Bible and everything. And then on the 
I mean, about love and the baby being born and the holiday and love being at the basis of all religions. He respected all religions and, and taught us that. But on the news, you know, we didn't see all that. We saw war, war, war. Um, let's see the next. Yeah, war, war, war. It was horrible. It was, some people call it a war of atrocity. Vietnam was so emotional and I do talk to Vietnam veterans and there's a museum in New Jersey I was at not that long ago before the pandemic, but I mean, it's so emotional. And so I like to also ask students or who, whatever audience I'm ever with, I usually ask how many of you had someone in the Vietnam War and who was it and you know, what was, it? have you had a chance to talk to them? So. Some students, you know, have feelings about all this. And I'm sure a lot of you have feelings about it also. Um, but for us, you know, it's just very emotional as children seeing all this. And kids feel that way today. I mean, this little girl told me not long ago, she's in seventh grade. She says, I feel so bad when sometimes when I see the news, but I just don't know what to do. And so it's also a lesson about how you can be active. And that's what civics is about. It's engaging with your, you know, country and what's going on in the world around you and it's the good news it's a good way of life so we felt sad about that we didn't know what to do so people had an idea we heard about an idea that some kids had to wear black armbands again but this time to mourn for the dead in Vietnam and this time to wear them to school so that's me and my mother and my dad is behind me um, it's really a family story of course because we were raised to you know, you can see how they went to Mississippi and believed in putting their beliefs into action, but um, they weren't polit they weren't pr particularly political or any kind of, you know, on the left or anything. They just believed that you should put your faith into action. But so five kids, it, well, t around 10 kids wore the armbands. The principals made a rule against armbands. Um, I was really scared and nervous and I went off to school. I was in eighth grade. I was 13 years old. It was 1965, and um, I was like the shyest kid you could imagine. Um, but you know, I had these examples, those Birmingham kids and stuff, and, and my parents and everything. So anyway, I did. I thought I would be brave and, and do this. So I got to math class, and Mr. Moberly sent me to the office. Mr. Moberly was my favorite teacher. I really liked. I loved math, but anyway, so um, I like social studies too. But I went to the office and the vice principal asked me to take off the armband and this is against the rules, Mary Beth. And it had come out in the newspaper the day before, I think that it was gonna be against the rules. And so it's kind of a real dilemma, moral dilemma and everything. I was so nervous and everything. So um, he told me to take off the armband. So I looked around and I, I took it off. I said, okay, you know, so I, I was really kind of relieved and I thought, oh, well, that's good, that's over with, you know, you can see it's, it wasn't over, but I got suspended anyway. And um, our dad, he hadn't thought that we should wear the armbands really. He, he thought we should maybe, you know, because the principals have a hard job and they've made a rule against arm. He was pretty conservative in a lot of ways. Mary Beth, how did the principals know how to make the rule against the armbands? They, they um, heard about, okay, one of the boys at Roosevelt Ho High School wrote an article for the school newspaper about the plan. And it went, they must have had prior review at Roosevelt High School. And also <laughs> we went back, we were there not too long ago, a few years ago, and tried to find the article in their archives and, and it had been taken out of the newspaper, but um, that's how they found out. So yeah, there was this rule, you know, the newspaper had come out and told everybody there's going to be a rule against armbands. So you know, that's what happened. That's how we got suspended. And this picture is from the school board meeting. Well, yeah, because we went, there was two school board meetings to try to change their mind, you know, and people lined up. A lot of kids spoke. Chris Eckhart spoke. He was the other plaintiff. There were three plaintiffs, me, my brother, John, and Chris Eckhart. Five kids got suspended. So, um, and then when the ACLU got involved, which I'm not 100% clear how that happened, if they approached my parents, I think they might have. Um, in any way, after they got involved, they said, well, yes, yeah, so we have to go back to the school board, of course, to try to negotiate first. They always want to negotiate first. Don't just go to court, you know, easily. So anyway, that's when we went back to the school board, they would not change their mind. 
And the vote was close there, I though. I think it was like four to three or five to four. I have to go back and look, but uh, some of the school board did vote for us. And the Des Moines Register came out in favor with an editorial in favor of us also. So let's see, what else is there? I want to wrap it up. Um, oh yeah, that's the day that we won. I was a junior in high school. We had, oh, I was so, it was a hard time in my life because I was, I had moved, we moved to St. Louis. Oh, big, scary city. And we did that when in November of my junior year in high school. So it was November. I didn't know a soul in high school. And I was really a shy person. So then all of a sudden, oh, it's time to go to the Supreme Court. So I went to the Supreme Court, which, which I barely remember because I think I was just stressed with everything else. But anyway, so that's um, me and my little brother, Paul, and my mom the day we won. Hope was there too, but everybody else was gone. My dad was gone. He was out of town. My brother, John, had grown up. He was in college. So the other kids had <clears throat> were in college. Meredith, one more question before we go to Q&A. So start putting your questions in Q&A if you haven't already. And um, that is about the, the kind of reaction that you got from other people in the, in the public um, when, you were, um, when, you, when the case was going through after you won. So just a little bit about the reaction to the case. Oh yeah, well, it was kind of mixed, but yeah, no, the the students didn't bully me really. Um, the the older kids at the high school got picked on, and and I think someone got punched when they were off campus. But one of the gym teachers was really awful to the high school kids, you know, calling them pinkos in the middle of class and stuff like that. But um, the main people that bullied us, I'd have to say, were the adults because some of these adults were just horrible. Like they would send I mean, people even threw red paint at our house, threw red paint at our car, threatened to bomb our house on Christmas Eve. Um, they call, a lady called me on the phone and threatened to kill me. Um, there was a radio talk show host that went on the air and said, if anybody wants to go after Leonard Tinker, I'll get them a lawyer, you know, basically. So yeah, that's one of our postcards. Um, that's always one of my, well, that red thing, you know, the hammer and sickle, I like to teach kids about that. Here's the real one. Um, and here's the stamps and everything. But, um, yeah, there was a bunch of hate mail. Some of the hate mail was at the museum until they closed. That's kind of crazy, but. Well, so I'm glad you said museum. Um, I also want to have to mention that the, the picture of Mary Beth holding the hate is, um, is at my school. Mary Beth was generous enough to come and speak to my classes I don't know, maybe 10 years or something, every year for, for 10 years or something. Um, so um, that, that's my picture of her. And the student that, that piece of hate mail always made such an impression on the students to, to see that in person. It's crazy. I mean, people would call us communist, communist, you know, anybody who spoke up against the war. I mean, the war was really just beginning a lot in a lot of ways. There had been about 1,000 U.S. soldiers killed. But, and as we know, there's, uh, so anyway, um, but yeah, the whole communist thing, my mom would always say, we're not communists, we're Methodists. Um, <laughs> so I'm glad you mentioned the museum because, the museum, because someone has um, asked in the chat, yes. wonder where the armband is, and I sort of, oh, oh yes, that's so alert, funny but, um, you, um, mentioned that because I was going to um, yeah, they had, they took it out of the mu the museum because you know the museum closed. So it's going to a. Um, this is so funny. Oh yeah, here we go. So when I got back to school that January, you know, I was in eighth grade. We had to write a report. What did you do over Christmas vacation? <laughs> so I wrote this report. And um, you know, it had to be on some subject that you were involved with over whatever. So um I just found this not a while back in a, in a box. I happened to be cleaning the basement. So anyway, so, and here's the armband. This was, this was so crazy, which I had pasted in my report. <laughs> and um, I think there's even some red corrections, like a misspelled word or something like that. There's no grade on it. So I, I really think I should have got an A plus, but regardless. I was going to say, I hope you got an A for sure. <laughs> what I did on my Christmas vacation. I won a Supreme Court case. <laughs> yeah, the Supreme Court. So that one's going to go. There's uh, the, 
the um, Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals is in St. Louis, which some of you from Missouri are, are here, I think. But anyway, um, so they're going to have a First Amendment museum there at the Eighth Circuit, which I went there. We went there for the case, and it was the first time I flew in an airplane, so that was exciting. Okay, so we are ready to start um, Q&A, and I think Jen had the... Um, had the way to participate already in there. And I'm seeing some people are already um, figuring out how to use the upvote. Um, so I'm gonna voice some of these questions and Jen, feel free to, um, to voice some questions too. Um, so I think the first question um, you, you sort of already answered, but I'll put it out there in case you have anything to add. And that's where the teachers supported of your viewpoint, yeah. or they shun your efforts. The teachers weren't supportive, but I went through the whole morning's classes, three classes, I think. Well, I used to take sewing class. I remember that was that day. Uh, life was sweet with sewing class. But anyway, um, so no teacher, teachers didn't mention it in the morning. I think I had social studies that morning. Too. But then it was after lunch in my math class before somebody actually noticed it. But the teachers basically said nothing about it. I think they were... It was just also strange for everybody. It was hard to make you know, sense of like, what about, as the, when we won, I had, I was thinking that it's kind of strange that my social studies teacher didn't say like, hey guys, you know, something kind of interesting happened to Mary Beth yesterday. Cause I mean, it was in the newspaper, it was on the front page of the um, New York Times and stuff and in the local papers and everything, because that little picture of my mother and me and my brother, Paul, that was in the paper and everything, so people knew that. But I think they were just people didn't know what to make of it. It changed the power relations suddenly. You know, you've got oh, the teachers were wrong, the principals were wrong, the school board was wrong. Um, you know, super into everybody. Oh, but the kids were right, and the Supreme Court said so. So that was kind of a big deal, and people were a little bit in shock. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, next question. Um, what similarities do you see between the student-led protests when you were involved and many of the student-led protests today? Yes, they're very similar. I think it's just so exciting when the, the students are speaking up because first of all, as I said, it's good for their health. And that's half the reason I do this because, you know, I'm a nurse and I care about kids. I've worked with kids and I believe in preventive health. And so, um, you know, I, that's another reason I want kids to know about their rights and to use their rights because they tell me your, your rights are like your muscles. If you don't use them, you could lose them. So um, what, were, what was the question? I forgot. Um, sorry, Kathy. Just the similarities between. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's great to see so many students speaking up and, and you know, joining together with others to, or if there's some issue they care about, they're doing some, you know, looking online, seeing what others are already doing, see what they can join in on. Um, I mean, there's just so much that students are, are speaking up about. It's really great. Good. Okay. So next question. Any suggestions for how to address with students now the importance of civic engagement and getting involved with causes to initiate change? So you've yes. spoken with a lot of student groups. You've had a lot of experience. And I have to say before she answers this, that um, there was never a time when Mary Beth uh, talked to my students that students didn't come back energized and with ideas about what they wanted to change and how they were gonna go about changing it. So I'm sure the answer um, is gonna be. Well, yeah, it's really great. Um, there, there's just, I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of you already know and already are engaged in things that are going on. And there are a number of groups that are really encouraging it. Um, you know, uh, like Teaching for Change. Um, there's the Southern Poverty Law Center. There's Street Law. There's um, Black Lives Matter in schools. <clears throat> That's really been building. This is the third year for Black Lives Matter in schools. So I know there's a lot, you know, going on. So I, I civics. Um, what's the other one? The one that is really great where middle school kids do projects. Uh, Project Citizen. That's really great where students identify a problem. And then they get to the root of the problem from a policy point of view. So there's a lot going on. I'm sure a lot of you could tell me about things you're doing as well. But Students are also calling for more and more, you know, uh, things to be given to them as opportunities and, and wanting to change the curriculum and getting involved in, 
speaking up about like uh, politics or policies. Students in DC last year almost passed, well, the year before last, lowering, lowering the voting age to 16. They had all the votes lined up in the Washington DC, uh, DC Council to pass it, but one person changed their mind. Um, so there's just a lot of, of things. Yeah, it's good. I see a lot of similarities and uh, I think it's exciting. Okay, next question. Um, what are your views on the effect of dress codes on this idea of symbolic speech? So, you know, the, well, I'll just, I'll just let you answer. Well, yeah, you could write a doctorate dissertation on dress codes and people have, um, there's so much. I mean, I, when I found out, I have a, I have a background in public health also. So we looked at teenagers, you know, as a, as the group and what is good for young people. And as it turns out, one of the best things for their health is for them to graduate from high school. So we want to keep students in high school. So you want to make it a place where they want to be and not a place where they hate to come to, you know, and it's already hard. So yeah, I mean, so, uh, some students I was talking to in St. Louis a couple days ago, they were talking about how they have to dress a certain way, you know, for the um, virtual classes and everything like that. But I just um, lean towards being a little bit looser on it and you wanna keep them in and keep them, I mean, kids are so traumatized now too. We're trying to prevent trauma. We're trying to, you know, just to be able to keep connected with them. A lot of kids are just, you can't find them. Schools are, you all know, you're trying to find the students, they're somehow gone. So yeah, I say not be not to be real strict is better, but teachers' rights and students' rights are also connected. So maybe you've seen some of the things this year about teachers having, you know, signs in back of their camera, like Black Lives Matter, et cetera. I think there was a teacher in Georgia, there's a big deal about it. So um you know, it's all kind of connected to, and even in the Tinker ruling, the ruling is that neither teachers or students leave their right, their constitutional right to expression at the schoolhouse gate. So teachers and students' rights are always connected. Um, I think you were involved, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I misremember this, but with a case out of Florida with um, where the principal banned the wearing of um, rainbows. Oh yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was a that was a dress code um, issue. Do you want to mention that? Did you make it to the Supreme Court? So probably not one that many teachers are aware of. Maybe the Florida teachers are. Yeah, maybe you probably you Florida teachers probably remember the city that it was in. I was down there that that I was supposed to go to that school and it was canceled. All, but yeah, that was. I only laugh because it was. I mean, it was laughable. I'm sorry to say because. The, this very clever young lawyer for the ACLU, Christine Sun, she was questioning the, I think it was the principal, the principal. And I mean, it was just crazy because he's, she's like, well, what about reading Rainbow? And he's like, yeah, I think that's a problem, you know? And she's like, well, what's the problem with rainbows? And he says, well, you know, when kids are going to see a rainbow, they're going to start thinking about gay, I don't know, gay sex, I think he even said, but regardless, um, it was just crazy. So for a while, yeah, students were laughing about that one too. But I mean, I kind of felt for the prince. I, I try not to laugh at people because I don't want to, you know, put people down. And I think it's just, you know, something that we can help him to understand that kids want to see rainbows and they might even want to think about gay people. And they got very, they got very um, clever by wearing Pink Floyd shirts and the mm -hmm. Macintosh, you know, the Apple symbol that has the thing and the Care Bears and um, oh. a lot of creativity in challenging um, the ban the rainbow dress code violations. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So those kids, those kids keep us, um, keep us going. There's, they're always coming up with some, um, some crazy, crazy, way crazier things than that too. Okay, so the next question is, um, did other students join your effort after your suspension? So did you get student support? No, after we were suspended. I mean, I was supposed, we were, we were all supposed to pass around this petition saying, you know, we have been, we're wearing these armbands for blah, 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 and we believe we should have the right to wear the armbands. So I got like, I think two, uh, well, I signed it. And then there was two other students, but one of them crossed it off, I think. I'd have to look back at it, but um I wouldn't exactly say we started a student movement at Warren Harding Junior High School, no. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so the next question is what, um, what were the lower court decisions in the case? So I know you mentioned going to Missouri um, for the circuit court. Yeah, the circuit court, well, it was um, split, I think, what was it? It somehow, it went to the en banc. So then there were eight judges and it was split. So wait a second. Yeah, so it would have had the effect of basically us losing. The, the district opinion was affirmed. And so therefore, the now right, what happened was that these kids in Mississippi had protested the murders of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman in 1964 in the summer in Mississippi, black students wore buttons to school to protest the murders. And their buttons said, one man, one vote snick. So um, they were told they could not do that. And a lawsuit started. It was called Burnside. The rights of students to free expression, except if they disrupt, substantially disrupt school. That standard comes from the Mississippi students case. Burnside is the name of it. Because when those students wore the buttons, a court case started. And it went through the courts. And in the Fifth Circuit, right before we lost at the Eighth Circuit, in the Fifth Circuit, the Burnside Mississippi students won their case. So then soon after that, we lost. So now you have a circuit split. So that's one of the ways that cases get to the Supreme Court because, you know, then they're like, well, let the Supreme Court decide. Um, so even though Supreme Court only takes, you know, 70 or 80 cases or something a year out of around 10,000, um, that was one of the reasons why they might take the case. And also, like Kathy said, there hadn't been many cases about students' rights. Free speech. And remember, we're talking about the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment here. But there are other, many other cases having to do with students' rights, children's rights. And, you know, that's how I see this case as a children's, teenagers, youth rights issue, a human rights um, issue. But there are cases having to do with strip search, um, Savannah Redding's case. There's a case called Rodriguez. This is very, very important in 1973, where the Supreme Court said, you do not have an equal right to education in the United States. Now, I know a lot of you have studied these cases and you know about these cases, but um, there are lots of other cases. Um, parents Concerned, which was a huge case around um, trying to get racial justice, racial equality in schools. And the, the, uh, that was Louisville and Seattle, that case. That was very significant. So there's lots of other cases having to do with kids' rights. <clears throat> I have a question um, that's not on the list, but I want to know the answer, so I'm going to ask it <laughs> um, about the, your case name. So, you know, most of the cases that we see with juveniles have the initials. So we're going to talk about a case later, Mahanoy Area School District BBL, and we know that, you know, there's the TLO case, which we all know and some teach. Um, so why does your name not, why does your case not have an initial? Was it your choice to put your full name on this case? That's a good question. I'm not really sure. Uh, we kind of asked our, we had a wonderful young lawyer named Dan Johnston who was right out of law school. Um, and by the way, we didn't have to pay for the lawyer for legal services. That was an ACLU, you know, case. So they, I, all the four cases that ours and then three later ones at the Supreme Court around student speech case, they were all ACLU cases. And Mahanoy is also an ACLU case, the one that's going to the Supreme Court, but regardless. So, uh, when they um, took the case, what, what were we, I'm sorry, I lost the question. About why you don't have initials, but you're- oh, Yeah, yeah, so he said, we asked him, you know, why did you name it Ting? Because there was also, Eckhart was also one of the plaintiffs. So I think it was mainly a thing that, you know, there were two of us, it was just easier, Tinker versus Eckhart. Um, I'm not sure why the, privacy wasn't an issue and why it is for BL. I really don't understand that. I'll have to ask some people myself. We'll find out. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, okay, was it part of the discussion that this would be essentially a silent protest? You mentioned that your father um, didn't want to provide any burden for the principal. And then I'm gonna add on to that question. That was the original question. I'm gonna add on to that question. Um, how did that 
figure into the arguments of the case as well. So was it part of your plan? You know, was it part of the discussion within your family that this would be a silent protest? And also how did that impact um, the idea that, you know, is it speech when it's not spoken? Well, it wasn't really, you know, planned to be silent and it wasn't necessarily silent because we did talk about it, you know, between classes and things like that. But um, it was meant to be not disruptive just like the Burnside students in Mississippi, the reason they won at the Fifth Circuit in Mississippi was because the judges said that they had not been substantially disruptive. And that's where that standard comes from that was cited later in the Tinker ruling. And they said that yes, and the Tinker students, you know, did not, were not substantially disruptive either. And the thing about that is that if the school can predict substantial disruption, it could also be enough to limit the student's speech. So that's very powerful. So in a way, it's almost kind of a weak ruling in some ways, because um, you know, if you, the other leg of the ruling is that you cannot impinge on the rights of others with your free speech. So something like Confederate flags, as far as I know, they've never won in court for schools. And you know, it, like if you want to say God's ashamed of your homosexuality, that's not going to win because of impinging on the rights of it. There's a bunch of the you know cases that have so that it impinges on the rights of others. So there's, there's those two kind of legs of the ruling. That's a perfect segue into the next question, which is what have been your reactions when students' rights cases have chipped away at the Tinker holding? So certainly in the immediate aftermath of Tinker, there was a lot of deference given to student speech, but over time, um, there have been most of the victories in court have been on the side of the school district. Um, so how, what have your personal reactions been to that? Well, there have been some victories for students as well. Um, there's a girl named Riley in Minnesota. I mean, there's a number I could think of right off the top of my head, but they've tried to tell her that she had to give over her password. I think it was for her face. I don't know what it was on social media. And she won that. And um, she, kids don't have to turn over their password. But I mean, that wasn't a Supreme Court case, so locally. But a student wanted to wear a Trump shirt and he was told he couldn't wear that, it's too political. He got a $25,000 settlement. This was, this was in Michigan um, and an apology from the school. And there's a number, I mean, the, a girl in Arizona who wanted to wear a Black Lives Matter shirt for photo day and she was told she couldn't do that. She ended up, it didn't have to go to court because when the school board lawyer, you know, talked it over with the principal, um, that was kind of a slam dunk, but so she ended up wearing it. So anyway, there's, I'm saying there's various victories, but at the Supreme Court, all the cases since ours have been a loss for students' rights. Um, Bethel versus Frazier, which is basically says you cannot have obscene speech in school. Hazelwood, which was the most damaging because it had to do with school sponsored speech and school newspapers especially. So that's a big case for journalism and 13 states have passed laws when the students lost that. They won at the district and the appeals level, Kathy Kuhlmeyer and the editors, but um, when they um, you know, lost that case, a number of state legislatures passed laws saying, no, we're going, our student journalists are gonna have rights. And, which you can do. A legislature can pass laws giving kids more rights. So 13 states now have done that. But that was the most damaging because it, it had a lot to do with student well-being. I mean, there, there was a nursery at that school for the babies of the students. And the school, the principal told them that they could not write about pregnancy and divorce in the school newspaper. And they had in the past, it had been in the school newspaper too. And they took out the page on self-help that had the suicide hotline. A boy later killed himself. Kathy Kuhlmeyer felt very, very bad about that. She thought maybe if it would have been left in the paper, he would have thought he seen the number, you know. So, so that really was a violation, I think, of kids' rights in a really important way with school newspapers. And a lot of my speaking with students and teachers around the country has to do with student journalism. But of course, you know, most schools don't have student, student journalism, only 25% of high schools. Um, so then the last case was the infamous Morris B. Frederick, the bong hits for Jesus case, where the Supreme Court not only said that students cannot promote illegal drug use, but they created a new type of space. It's not in school, not out of school, it's school sanctioned. And also what really hurt me, my feelings there was that in the, in the uh, 
in the decision, Clarence Thomas is part of it, he calls for the reversal of Tinker. And in that, um, his opinion, he says that Tinker should never have been decided in favor of the students anyway. So there's that case. Great, thank you. So that uh, leads to the next question. And um, th our next um, of, of um, webinars are gonna be on Mahanoy. Um, but students are really wanting, or teachers are really wanting to know what your um, views are on that situation and off-campus social media speech. Um, so without completely taking away our thunder from our webinars <laughs> to come, um, what, what are your views on the well, main? Yeah, I'll and, just, oh, sorry. Well, you, oh, no, I just wanted to say, because I, I have a little background information, can you mention um, the amicus brief? In your yeah, well, I don't know if everybody knows what happened there, but it's going to be interesting. You were talking earlier about teaching with middle school students, and um, there's always that issue like there is with the um, Bethel versus Frazier case, which had to do with this sexual innuendos in this speech, which the court ruled you cannot, could not be allowed in school. So when you teach the case, you have to think of, you know, sometimes you want to say the speech itself, but maybe some principal may not want you to say that speech in that school and the court ruled against. So they have that same issue with the Mahanoy case because, you know, it's got the, the um, F word. It's pretty hard to discuss the case without talking about why she had her middle finger up on her um, Snapchat, I think it was. So, but that was, I mean, she won at the district level and she won at the appeals level because the court basically said, I was reading some of the ruling that, you, the school made a rule against that violated the First Amendment. And yes, there are limits to school speech. And there are a lot of them. All these cases I talked about where the students lost, but, um, you know, restricted this. Yeah. And and for, people, more. for people who might not be familiar with that case, a cheerleader who um, used Snapchat to show her disapproval um, very vividly of being put on the JV team for a second year in a row was suspended from the team, not, not from school. She was suspended from the team. Yeah. So um, I sometimes, you know, I basically describe it as, you know, she was cursing um, at the cheerleading team. And I mean, it's fine to say, uh, well, of course, you know. Um, Could you talk about the amicus brief, about your amicus brief? Yeah. So I'm not sure what I feel about it is I have mixed feelings. I'm thinking about it still. I mean, I just read the school, the school's brief, their argument for why out of school speech should be, you know, basically covered. Uh, and, um, you know, there's the issue of bullying and that is an issue, but I also think, well, first of all, a lot of administrators, cause I speak to a lot of school lawyer groups and organizations and school administrators groups and superintendents. So, you know, they don't all want to have responsibility. And I'm sure all of you teachers don't either for, School, students out of school speech, uh, that's kind of a lot to ask. You already have a lot, you know. You're, and so there's that issue, number one, but I know there already is a responsibility. And parents, you know, as far as bullying, parents expect the school to do something, you know, when there's bullying. So there's, it's a lot of issues. And, um, you know, one thing, when I'm talking to students and I get into these issues, I just say, well, the bottom line is, should you be able to talk about this or other controversial issues in school? That's what the case is about. It's not like, you know, we're going to have to come to the answers together and figure it all out. And I'm glad the kids, even fifth graders, fourth, you know, I'm glad they're learning and thinking about it because it's not like some adult somewhere knows the answer to all these things. So I want them to learn about it and weigh in too. What do they think? about it but yeah it's kind of um complicated so i don't want to see the the uh, rights that were gained in tinker eroded more and um i think you know it's it would have a very chilling effect but i'm not sure i don't feel very hopeful i don't know we'll just see but yeah there's an amicus being developed by the same person who wrote a an amicus for um there was a case in California having to do with flag shirts called Dariano where some students were pla American flag shirts to school and they were not allowed to do that. Why? Because they did it on Cinco de Mayo to mock the Mexican kids. <clears throat> so we ended up writing an amicus for that as well 
um, it was not accepted. The, the case was not accepted at the Supreme Court and the students lost at both the district and appeals level. But um, I, our argument, I think there should be less censorship and more dialogue myself. I think we need to talk about the things, even when uh, hate speech is a huge issue, of course. And um, so it's not enough in my mind to just punish students. We need to talk to students and start anti-racism education, I think in like kindergarten and in pre I mean, you know, we need to really change the way our country deals with racism, which is why I, I tell this story through the lens of anti-racism. I like to teach kids about, you know, the history of the Birmingham children and their, their I always call them the Black Lives Matter of our time. And so I think almost everything we do in school, we have to think about how can we teach anti-racism too, because we are in a terrible state in our country when it comes to racism and it's just absolutely horrible. <clears throat> someone asked, um, since we were just talking about the amicus brief, um, someone asked if you have filed amicus briefs in other cases. Um, and it might be surprising for some people to know that you know private citizens can file amicus briefs. Yes, there was the one in the Dariano and my brother John joined in that too. And um, he's gonna be joining in the Mahanoy one too. But um, the other one was the Taylor Bell case where a student in, I think he was in Mississippi, he did a rap song. The gym teacher was being kind of accused and thought to be molesting some girls. And so this student made a rap song about it and his language was very well it was some people's yes chalked it up to hey it's rap you know and so it was kind of strong um and uh so he was i think expelled and uh, he lost in court so anyway very interestingly a very conservative group called the liberty institute approached me about them and us signing an amicus in that case because it's a very conservative group but they conservative and mostly con um, concerned with freedom of religion but conservative people also like the tinker case and the tinker ruling in many ways because um you know they want their students to have a voice also and so the liberty institute even you know hosted us at the Supreme Court a few years ago and featured the Tinker case and um, Justice Alito hosted the whole thing and it was very interesting. So yeah, I think- Strange bedfellows. <laughs> hot what? Strange bedfellows there. <laughs> yeah, that was very interesting. Um, I <laughs> asked him if he, would t if he would support students' rights and he said, yeah, well, I guess I would because I think kids would have rights. So, um, yeah. I should have prefaced my question with a definition of amicus briefs, so apologies. Um, an amicus brief is a brief that um, parties that are not party in the case can file that gives their viewpoints on the case. And so in the one case, um, Mary Beth was talking about an amicus for um, a, a writ of certiorari. So when you, you write a, a brief saying this is why the Supreme Court Court should take this case. And then there is also um, a, a miki, which is the plural for the actual case, when you say to the court, this is how we think you should decide this case. And um, for um, a case that about student speech, there are many such amicus briefs, uh, amiki, um, filed, because you can imagine um, the National School Board Association um, has some and, um, you know, student speech and the ACLU and, um, for instance, for the Mahanoy case, which um, I, I see there's been lots of stuff in the chat, so we'll definitely talk about the, uh, the availability of those materials later, um, but there, there have been many filed and probably many more to come, including yours. So we are almost out of time, and I apologize to the questions that we didn't get to for Q&A, but I did, Mary Beth, want to give you a chance to sort of sum up if there are things that um, that you want to say to the teachers since you have this audience um, before we thank you and, and let you go on your way. Thank you very much, Kathy and Jen, and it was so good to be with all of you, and I I'm just a fan of all of you teachers. I know it's it's a crazy hard time in so many ways. And so if I can ever, you know, help with your classes, I'll try to. Um, I've offered teachers around the country um, video classes, you know, this, this year. Um, 
So if I can schedule it, I will. I have a, there's a website called tinkertourusa.org and you can see my itinerary on there and check I'm it out. drop that in the chat right now. And then also you could write to me. It's my email is tinkertour at gmail. Um, but uh, it's been so good being with all of you. And I'm so glad you're teaching students about these issues because we need the input of young people. When young people's voices are stifled and when they're discouraged, it doesn't just hurt them. It hurts all of us because we need their input. And I know that all of you and I are kindred spirits in this because we work with young people and we, we respect, you know, that they... They need to also weigh in on the problems, the issues of our time with their, one, with their ideas, their creativity, their solutions, their sense of fairness, their, their willingness to take action, their willingness to, to take risk, which young people are more likely. So I'm, I'm glad you're encouraging them all. And um, I'm glad to be here encouraging all of you. And I hope we can meet again, maybe one of these days again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, Mary Beth will be back next week to talk to your students. So we'll talk more about the other webinars, um, but much the format of what just happened, although uh, of course we'll have to sort of adjust a little bit for, for students, but um, please encourage your students to be able to hear um, Mary Beth's experiences and, and see her personal photos and things like that too. So. Definitely. And if your students can come, tell them that I can't wait to meet them and I want to hear if they're using their First Amendment rights or issues they care about. And, and I can't wait to meet all the students. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thanks again. Good night, everybody. Um, all right. Well, that was quite an experience. Um, Kathy and I dropped Mary Beth's uh, tour website and her email in the chat just in case you want to reach out directly to her. Um, as you heard Kathy mention, uh, she visited Kathy's class, what, 10 years in a row? Um, so she's very generous with her time and students really, um, obviously she's super engaging and students really love that opportunity. Um, a couple of things, I guess, before we move forward, just things that popped up in the chat. One is um, we've been corrected a couple of times on our pronunciation of Mahanoi. Um, so thank you to Pennsylvania residents who have corrected us. Kathy's from and Pennsylvania. I, have, she I was going to say, I have to admit, I'm from Pennsylvania and I, and I apparently got it wrong. <laughs> um, and then the other question, Kathy, if you want to uh, jump back in, I know you probably don't have an exact date, but when, uh, what's the estimate of the date for when the Mahanoi um, case summary might be available? Uh, I'm hoping very much early next week. So um, one of the things you might not know about Street Law, even if you're really familiar with us, is that our materials undergo a really stringent legal review. So um, it is out with an expert right now. And these are generally um, very sought after uh, constitutional lawyers. And so, and they very generously donate their time to us um, to do this. So, um, so it's really hard to, to, imp to impose a really strict deadline on them when they're doing us such a great favor. So unfortunately, I'm a little bit at the mercy of our legal reviewer, um, but as soon as it comes back from legal review, it will be posted. And a little um, asterisk on that, um, this case is so new, it's not even scheduled for, um, it's not even scheduled for argument yet. And the respondent um, has not filed their brief yet. So BL and family have not yet filed their brief. So we're going on um, for, the, for their arguments on what we believe to be their arguments based on their petition for cert, their lower court arguments, um, but when their brief, when their merits brief is filed, um, we may update the materials a little bit if they make an argument that we didn't predict. So just a little asterisk on these materials. They will be a little premature, but we know people are chomping at the bit to teach it. So we're going to go ahead and sort of stick our neck out a little bit and put these materials out with, with what um, we predict to be their arguments. Great. Thanks, Kathy. So the next um, uh, maybe 45 minutes or so, we're gonna talk a bit more about teaching um, Tinker. And this is an opportunity. This is one of the reasons why we have the chat 
wide open is that you all are experts, many of you are experts in teaching Tinker yourself. What we have is just another tool for your toolbox, hopefully, um, but we would love for you to share any strategies, resources, et cetera, that you use that have been successful for your students. Um, and probably particularly this year, that's that's going to be interesting. We all know that instruction looks has looked different over the past year and people might have uh, questions. I saw a question in the chat earlier about how you would do a MOOC um, a, a moot court simulation if you were in hybrid learning. Uh, so any suggestions or thoughts that you have that you wanna bring up about teaching Tinker, um, please feel free to put in the chat and get that back channel chat going. Um, the Q&A right now is going to change over to a Q&A about teaching Tinker. So if there are questions left over from um, Mary Beth will probably dismiss them and focus more on uh, any questions that come up about teaching Tinker and we'll save some time toward the end of it, this for uh, teaching Tinker. So one of the things that uh, that's sort of a hallmark of, of the work that street law does around uh, studying case um, studying different Supreme Court cases is uh, what we call case studies in the classroom strategies. And um, Street Law has hundreds of free uh, case summaries available on its website. Um, we have uh, the website store.streetlaw.org, which has lots and lots and lots of them. And then landmarkcases.org has um, what, something like 15 to 20 cases. Kathy, I'll know the exact number. 20. 20, all right. Um, and some very recently added new cases that, that Kathy will mention at the very end. Um, but so we have, we have lots of case summaries available uh, for free. And I dropped all of those links that Jen said in the chat box. I know there's a lot going on in the chat. So I just wanted to call people's attention to the fact that, I, that they're there. So the case summaries, we try to set up and format in a certain way so that you can take those case summaries and manipulate them to do different activities. So all of our case studies, for the most part, have these elements to them. Facts, issues, precedents, arguments, decisions. We've started to change um, some of the elements a little bit lately. So we have more and more middle school versions of cases, and there are some variations for middle school, um, where, for example, we combine the precedents into a facts and background section. Um, those summaries are a lot shorter than our high school versions. And uh, some of our cases now have an impact section where we feel comfortable um, where if we feel comfortable writing the impact, then we will, but there are obviously some cases where it's hard to say what the impact is so far, so we haven't written the impact in there. So all of Street Law's case summaries are available to you as Microsoft Word documents. And those Word documents, um, we want, we give them to you in Word because we want you to be able to change uh, the documents up based on seven different strategies that we have uh, for uh, teaching these case summaries. So these are the seven strategies. And um, in the chat, there's probably, I'm gonna double check that it's there. Yep, the using case studies in the classroom guide, which is gonna go over how to do each of these activities. Um, I'm gonna just talk very briefly about each of them, but then we're gonna do um, a, a couple of these activities together. So uh, generally speaking, these are sort of scaffolded from left to right. Um, kind of going across also. So anatomy of a case, um, for example, is where you would delete the subtitles and uh, ask students to try to fill in the section. So which section is the facts? Which section is the arguments for this side? Which section is the arguments for that side? You can probably only do that so many times before students pick up on the pattern, um, but it's a good introductory um, uh, activity to help students get to know the way that a, a case summary would be written. Um, today we're going to do choosing unmarked opinions and classifying arguments, those two activities. Um, but then there's judicial opinion writing where you uh, have students read everything but the decision and then they have to write uh, an opinion as though they were a justice. Student law firms where there's no arguments and no decisions, you delete those two and you have students in uh, sort of makeshift law firms generate the arguments themselves. Applying precedents. Um, which I'm going to let Kathy talk about because that's her baby. Uh, yes, and we'll be seeing an example of that one later. And that's the one where um, you take a case like Tinker 
and the students read about that case and the precedent that it sets, then you look at a, a more um, current case or and, and hopefully a case um, that hasn't been decided yet, which is great. And then the students have to apply the precedent. And this is a really important skill to have. Um, if you're teaching AP, when people were introducing themselves, I saw a lot of AP things there. Um, the new FRQ3, the SCOTUS, in, the SCOTUS comparison uh, question is really that skill. How you take a precedent of a case that you already know the 15 required cases from the redesign and apply it to a case that you're unfamiliar with and decide whether it's analogous so it should control the decision in the new case or it's distinguished enough it's different enough from that case that it shouldn't control the decision. Thanks Kathy. Uh, and then the last activity, um, certainly one of the most fun activities, is to do a, a moot court or mini moot court simulation. We have materials on both of those uh, methodologies or, or variations on that simulation in our store and they're in the using case studies in the classroom um, document. Uh, with that, you would eliminate the decision and you can choose whether you want to keep the arguments or eliminate the arguments, keep some of the arguments, eliminate some of the arguments. Um, we've been doing some online moot courts lately and found uh, a pretty successful method um, that we're happy to talk about uh, later if, if that is a question. So I mentioned earlier uh, landmark cases and that landmark cases is updated. This is just a, a, a quick screenshot of the newly updated landmark cases. And if you wanted to right now, take a look at what a um, what a, a, a case summary looked like, you could go to landmarkcases.org uh, and find the Tinker case and pull up um, the high school or the middle school level. Those are PDFs. Um, and in our street law store, you could find the word versions. You can see um, just below where the, the readings are circled, that there's additional links. And so Landmark Cases has a lot of extra resources um, in it for each of the cases um, that, that it includes. So you can see background reading, um, there's activities and uh, uh, source analysis and things like that. Um, so definitely encourage you to take a look at that. That was completely revamped over the summer and into the school year. Kathy will talk a little bit more about that later as we wrap things up. So I mentioned earlier, we're gonna talk about classifying arguments as, and we're gonna do some classifying arguments as one of the activities um, to make today's session interactive. Um, going to talk about this first one uh, and then do uh, an online version of this, but we have for many of our um, cases, uh, classifying arguments activity that's already set up for you so that you don't need to create it yourself. Um, and the, uh, link that was dropped into the chat um, or will be dropped into the chat soon of that uh, of the the tinker um, classifying arguments is something that you can you students can use online it's in a uh, PDF fillable um, version here's that link um, so that's something that students could do individually uh, if you wanted to, or you could assign students in small groups in a breakout room if you're uh, online or, you know, working side by side if they're together. Um, but we obviously can't do that. So we're going to um, do kind of an online version of classifying arguments. And the way that we're going to do that is through uh, an online web tool called Poll Everywhere. So if you want to um, participate here, uh, then grab that Poll Everywhere link that Kathy just put in the chat, or you can just type it into a browser or your, your phone's browser, your computer's browser. You'll want to go to pollev.com backslash streetlawinc431. And people uh, always have questions about Poll Everywhere once we start using it, um, just about its, its functionality for them. Um, so we are using a paid version because we need for people, we need for lots of people to be able to respond, but you can have up to 30 responses uh, for free on a Poll Everywhere if you decided that you want like Poll Everywhere. And there's lots of different types of questions. We're gonna just do um, a couple, but there's word clouds and things like that. So take a moment if you haven't yet to pull up Poll Everywhere. 
I need to change the screen that I'm sharing. Oops. I don't need to change the screen that I'm sharing. I need to do this. Okay. You see, Kathy, you see the um, poll everywhere? Not yet. It's popping up now. Okay. There we are. All right, so the way that this is going to work, we're gonna do classifying arguments um, for a couple different arguments is, we've got two arguments here, one on the left, one on the right, and we're asking which of these two arguments supports Tinker. And the way that you respond is you put a click and you can see some of them coming in, you click on top of the argument that would support Tinker. So um, you can see these green uh, locations coming in that, show people some, someone got a little excited and put one outside of the box, but I still know what you were thinking about. So yeah, so, so obviously this one, the students wearing the arm brands didn't infringe on any other students' rights. Um, that is the argument that supports Tinker. Uh, and, and then the other one um, supports the school district, Des Moines, um, that they were acting in uh, their their appropriate authority as a school district. So and I'll just add in here really briefly that um, while we, we change these to language that students can understand, when we do um, the case summaries, the, the arguments are the actual arguments the parties made at court. So they're not our arguments, they're their arguments. So here's the next one. We'll keep the question the same every time, which argument supports Tinker? Yeah, and Mary Beth talked a bit about this earlier, um, that the armbands uh, were a, a form of speech that uh, someone put in the question um, in the Q&A, and I think it's a question that we didn't get to, but was this always meant to be silent and passive speech or not? Um, that's, that's definitely a, a, an interesting question. Let's do another one. We won't do too many more. Let's do one more. Which of these arguments supports Tinker? We've got um, Brooke in, in the chat asked, do you suggest this as a review or as a way to teach the case? Um, I think obviously we're going through this very quickly and you guys are very quick readers. Um, you're also familiar with the case, which kind of implies that what the activity we're doing right now might look like a review, but if we slowed way down, this could be a, a way to teach the case where you've more deeply gone through the facts of the case and um, the precedents and the issue of the case. And then students get to look at two different arguments and know that one of these arguments is a Tinker argument and one of these arguments is a Des Moines argument. Pause to think about which one is which. Um, I mean, this is something that you could even uh, you know, have students confer with each other before they make this decision. And I'm going to show you some um, ways that, one of the ways that we suggest doing it if students are in person, that really allows for more of that um, back and forth uh, discussion before making that decision about which, which uh, argument is which. So I think, I mean, we get, we get the idea here, um, a, a way to do classifying arguments. And just some, um, some themes from these arguments, some kind of thematic questions about whether, whether wearing an armband is considered speech, um, whether the speech causes disruption to learning, uh, whether the speech puts anyone in harm's way, and who's allowed to put limits on speech, whether it's the federal government uh, or, or who's allowed to kind of have a say of, about speech, the federal government or state and local government. So those are some of the, um, the different themes that come out of this. Let's drop that out. So one way that you could do this if you are, uh, if you have some students who are in person right now is to take the arguments and to cut them up into strips, 
mix them all up, put them in an envelope, and then have students work in teams, ideally, because cooperative learning works really well here, to sort the arguments. Are these arguments for the Tinker side? Are these arguments for the Des Moines side? Let's talk through it. Let's um, kind of go back and forth if we have any disagreements about it. Um, and then one thing that we encourage after, uh, after students figure out the answer is to move to kind of an extension of this activity. So the extension of this activity is um, to rank the arguments and think about which arguments are most compelling and which arguments are least compelling. So this next question from Poll Everywhere gives you five different arguments and asks you to rank the arguments for Tinker. So we're saying all five of these arguments are Tinker arguments asks you to rank them from which are the most compelling or the most uh, persuasive and which do you think are the least compelling or the least persuasive. So this is again back on poll everywhere. And the way that this works is it's gonna give you kind of the five arguments and you click on one to, and then hit the up arrow or the down arrow to move them around. And then you hit when you're, when you're comfortable with your responses, you hit submit and it will um, rank them. So we've got one submission, two submissions. It's going to start moving fast now, but it'll take kind of the averages and uh, figure out as a group which arguments we think are most compelling and which arguments we think are um, least compelling out of this list. So I'll give folks a little bit more time to think through what their own opinions and see where these, these arguments move. And the ranking extension, we're, we're doing it online, but the ranking extension can really easily, easily be replicated in person with those strips to have students move the strips around, you know, pull the strip um, that you think is, is a, the strongest argument up to the top um, and so on. Incorporation wasn't getting a whole lot of love there for, for the longest time, but it moved up to fourth. I was glad to see that. Yeah, some interesting. So Kathy and I actually had to decide. We have six arguments on the case summary. And when we practiced the, um, the ranking activity, we couldn't see the six, so we eliminated one um, and it was, kind of challenging to figure out which one to eliminate, but ultimately we figured one out. But that the one that's currently ranked fifth was in the running for one of the ones that we should eliminate. So um, maybe validating to see that you guys are sort of agreeing with us. Let's try uh, the, the Des Moines um, arguments. I don't know which way they are. So let's go for this. Nope, okay. All right, so here we've got the Des Moines arguments. Um, these are five of the six arguments that are in the classifying arguments um, or activity. And same as before, take a look at the arguments, click and manipulate them to move them up and down based on what you think is the best argument or the most persuasive argument versus the least persuasive.
Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for, for participating in that. We've still got a couple rankings coming in. Yeah, uh, this is what you think is the most compelling. Um, I don't, I'd have to think about like what the best sources might be for me to decide what the what Des Moines thought was most compelling. Maybe listening to oral arguments would help me figure out um, what what their perspective was about what the best arguments were. Kathy, do you want to weigh in on that at all? If you had to answer this question about ranking from the perspective of the maybe the attorneys for either side rather than you yourself. Yeah, I would look at the briefs. I wouldn't actually look at oral arguments because of the justices. Uh, I, I would look at oral arguments because I enjoy that kind of stuff. Because, but, but I wouldn't for that purpose. I would definitely look at the briefs because they're going to try to put their strongest arguments first, and they're going to spend more pages on their arguments uh, on the, what they think is their strongest argument. So I definitely think that by looking at their briefs, you could discern what their arguments are, which is one of the reasons that the that the materials. Um, for the cheerleader case might might change once we once we see what their actual brief says. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. And I think that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, whether you should rank these as you or rank these from the perspective of someone else. It's not something I'd considered, but it's it's it's, it's an interesting way to view that. Something that that you kind of. Um, change with that activity if you wanted. So this is um, another one of our uh, case study strategies. What we're, the slide that you're looking at right now is uh, choosing unmarked opinions. Um, and there's kind of two ways to approach this. There's the choose the opinion that you think the Supreme Court um, had as the majority opinion, or what we have here, which is not what was the right answer, but what do you think the right answer should have been? Um, so take a look at those two opinions and you can see that there are um, some quotes excerpted from, one of these is the majority, one of these is uh, dissent. Um, and let us know what you think the ruling should have been, opinion A or opinion B. And you can just put your answer in the chat if you'd like, or if you wanna be really independent and you have your own idea for a ruling that's not A or B, it's C. Um, I, I'd love to hear uh, any independent justices who would like to create their own ruling um, for this case. Yeah, I figured we'd got a lot of opinion Bs. Maybe if we had any uh, school administrators here, we might get uh, an opinion A. And I'm about, I'm about to hand this off to Kathy, but I think one of the things I wanna do before then is just plug um, using Tinker as a, a, a case that students can moot. Um, I think that from my experience with street law, I've got a lot, of, a lot of teachers that I've interacted with like to moot current cases. And that's great. You know, that's one of the reasons why we do SCOTUS in the classroom. But uh, we found that Tinker is also a great case to moot that, um, unless students are really informed, and some of them absolutely are, um, but the, they don't know what's around the corner sometimes. And so uh, it, it, this case really speaks to them. They understand it. Um, we're doing a lot of work with Chicago Public Schools, and I see my friend Dora is with us today. Um, and Chicago Public Schools does uh, has this case built into their, their standards at, or their curriculum as a, a, a moot court that students do. And I've had the chance to watch eighth graders moot this case and it, it was really amazing. So definitely, um, you know, continue uh, thinking about different cases that, that might fit into a moot court simulation. And this is certainly one of them. Kathy, I'll leave it to you. Great, so it is no surprise to any of us who won this case. Um, this is of course the New York Times article about the high court upholding the student protest. There's an, um, that same picture, I think, of Mary Beth with just focused in on her. Um, she didn't say it today, but um, a lot of times she mentions when she talks to students that she thinks that um, she became the face of this case, um, you know, for reasons that her attorney thought that a young, fresh-faced girl, you know, she doesn't seem like she's very threatening. Um, that she was the, became the face of the case for, for that reason. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. 
And of course, the, the part of the decision that we had before um, becomes the part that becomes, you know, the famous quote from the Tinker decision. It can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. That comes from um, Justice Abe Fortas, who wrote for the majority. There was also a blistering dissent in this case. Um, which would uh, be interesting to show your students if you have a lot of time. So that decision that we just talked about um, establishes what we has become known as the Tinker Test. And sometimes, um, sometimes it's also known as the um, substantial disruption standard um, because that was um, what came out of um, the, the decision, it was very much a double-edged sword. So it gave students the right to freedom of expression, but it also, um, it also allowed schools to curtail the speech if it creates, or as Mary Beth said, has the potential to create substantial disrupt disruption. So Jen talked about cases that are good to, um, to, to moot um, two of these cases went the whole way to the Supreme Court. There are great cases to moot. Actually, can you go back for a second, Jen? Sorry. Um, the other two didn't. Um, they stopped at the circuit, but um, the, the I Love Booby, um, Boobies uh, bracelets that you see, um, that case is Easton Area School District VBH. And in that case, um, they found um, for the students that the that the are that the bracelets weren't substantially disruptive. Um, the next case over on the top, and that is Fraser standing in front of the Bethel Senior High School. A lot of you teach this case, um, Bethel v. Fraser, and that's the case that Mary Beth alluded to where there was a lot of sexual innuendo in a speech about a student um, council candidate. And um, the Supreme Court found in that case for, um, for, the, um, for the school that, they, that that could create a substantial disruption. There have been a lot of cases about, um, about Confederate flag wearing. The one that made it the furthest in the courts and sort of gets the most notice is called Hardwick v. Hayward, although that's not a picture of that particular case um, because it's a female that's wearing the, um, the Confederate flags. But in that case, um, the circuit court found for the school because they felt that in, um, in that particular school, at least, that there was a lot of potential. Um, and the last one is the Bong Kids for Jesus case um, that Mary Beth talked about. That's Morse v. Frederick. And we'll talk about some materials we have to teach that case um, in just a second. And that, of course, um, is, is a case that students love to moot. Um, my, my daughter in her AP government class mooted that case and was so excited because um, for the first time in that teacher's um, experience, the um, the school won. So, so even when they know the way that the or the um, sorry the student won. So even if they already know the way that the case is going to come out, it's still a good moot sometimes. And um, and if the side that doesn't prevail, the Supreme Court can win at the at, in the moot. They feel especially proud. I think. Okay. Um, we wanted to highlight some materials that we have, and I'm going to drop some of these links um, in the newly um, rent, um, revised landmark cases. Um, one of the things that was added for Kohlmeyer, Hazelwood v. Kohlmeyer, is an applying precedence activity. And it takes um, Tinker v. Des Moines uh, that we just looked at and it applies it to Hazelwood v. Kohlmeyer. And Mary Beth talked a lot about that case. They're actually um, friends, I think, at this point, it's not too strong to say, and they, um, and the case definitely was a precedent, and in this case, they applied it to the student press as well as student speech, um, and of course, the school prevailed in that case, and that probably some of you out there are um, newspaper sponsors or yearbook sponsors, and you're probably very familiar with that case because it probably, um, probably influences uh, what you do at school, but the idea of prior restraint in um, publications that could be seen as being um, speech that is school, um, school approved 
is, um, is, is still the precedent out there. So this case gives the students the facts in, um, um, in Hazel, in Tinker gives them the facts in Hazelwood and it lets them apply that precedent. Go ahead, Jen, sorry. Um, the other materials that we have all ready for you is um, Morse v. Frederick judicial, um, judicial Opinion Writing. And in this case, it gives them um, a lot of precedents. It will give them um, Tinker and Frazier and Hazelwood um, so they can apply a lot of different precedents. It will give them the facts in Morse v. Frederick, but it will let them off before um, the the actual argument. So they'll get the background, they'll get the facts, they'll get the, the constitutional issue, but then it'll be up to the students um, to make an opinion based on that. And so um, it, it's up to you whether you want to su uh, supply them with the arguments or not. You could give them the arguments. Um, Jen talked about the fact that these documents are all downloadable as Word documents. So if you want to supply your students with the arguments, you can, and then they would write an opinion either um, if they were a justice, would they support Morse or would they support Frederick? Um, would they find that the Bong Hits for Jesus banner um, could, be dis could be disciplined and that the principal is not responsible and can't be sued? Um, or would they find for the student? So we did want to highlight um, the SCOTUS in the classroom that we have. So um, this is a part of our of our uh, a page on our website that has information about cases in the current term, and it goes back many many years. So you can get a lot of the more recent cases. Um, this year, the ones the cases that we have focused on is Torres v. Madrid, which is a case about excessive um, police use of force. Um, Caniglia v. Strom, which is about the community caretaking role of the police, and um, very, very soon, um, the, I don't, now I'm very self-conscious about the way I'm saying it. Dan, you say it. The Mahanoy, Mahanoy. The Mahanoy area school district, VBL will be added. Um, some people ask in the chat if we could send out the, those materials to everybody who attended this. Um, we can send a link to this page or a link to the store. Um, I checked with our communications person. Um, but you could also find it and maybe find it sooner by checking back at this uh, SCOTUS in the classroom page and Jen just dropped that link. And that will give you um, our materials. We're going we're gonna to adapt those materials also for middle school. So there'll be the high school case summary, the middle school case summary. We'll do some kind of activity, probably in a um, uh, classifying arguments, but maybe some other activities as well. They'll all be linked to at this page. You can also link straight to the briefs in the case and a couple articles that we've chosen um, to help. Um, to help you teach this case. Eventually, we'll also have links to the decision and the recording of the oral arguments. And of course, like all of the cases since last um, May, when the court started hearing cases again, um, they will be um, available live as the court hears the telephonic arguments. Um, so it's really pretty cool. I know that, you know, the chances of it happening during your class um, will, be, will be slim, but, but students and you can listen to the oral arguments live and then immediately the recordings are available since, since the pandemic struck. Used to take till Friday, but now you can get them right away. Okay, so we did want to spend some time talking about how you might adapt these activities um, for your classroom. And so um, you can drop that in the chat. And we'd be interested to know, um, probably some of you out there have used these activities. Um, you can talk about poll everywhere if you want to. Um, or just um, mooting. So Jen mentioned, um, we don't have a lot of time to, to talk about, uh, to go into how to do a moot court, but at that um, SCOTUS in the Classroom website that I talked to you about or webpage, you can also find information about how to moot cases or do mini moots of cases. Um, so drop in the chat how you might adapt these activities or the activities you might use in your classroom to, tink up, to teach about Tinker. And um, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A if you are more, um, if you're more comfortable doing that. There's a question in there about um, property rights in school, but let's see. 
I'll, I'll try to answer this one before we go. So one of it, the question in there says, can you talk about property rights in school? Um, I'm not sure exactly, maybe that person could, um, could clarify a little bit. I'm not sure exactly what kind of property rights, if you're alluding to sort of search and seizure rights um, and, your, and your privacy in your own property, if that's what you mean by property rights, because certainly um, there have been a lot of cases um, that, that establish that um, as far as your right to um, like the TLO case and some further cases that schools have a much lower burden to prove um, the need to search. They only need a reasonable suspicion, but I'm not sure if that was what you were getting at. Okay, so we have some things in the chat now. Um, we have um, applying precedence activities. Um, yeah, the applying precedence activities, we would love to have some feedback if you use them in your classroom. Um, doing a moot with Tinker, absolutely. Um, we've also been uh, doing a lot of training on the idea of mini moots. So one of the one of the concerns that some teachers have about moots um, are that it leaves a lot of students in the classroom maybe not directly participating. So with mini moots, you can group your students in much smaller groups, and everyone is actively participating in the role of justice attorney or um, attorney for the petitioner or attorney for the respondent and no one is no one's passive um, in the in those okay um. good the check for understandings using these activities as checks for understandings to make sure they're understanding the the case Oh, um, yeah, so there's, a, there's one that says it would be great if we bound them all together in some sort of workbook. I mean, one of the beautiful things about these, um, about these lessons is that um, because they only exist online, they're also free. Um, so, uh, so I think that's a, a really big benefit is that, um, and, and we'll talk more about um, the fact that we call our store the store, but nothing's going to cost you any money. Um, so um, if we bound them, there would have to be, um, there would have to be a fee uh, attached to it. And the other great thing is that um, because you can download them as Word files. You can really decide what you're gonna give your students and not gonna give your students. Um, for instance, since we were just talking about moots, um, we, uh, we have done moots with teachers both ways where we give teachers only the, the facts in the issue and they have to generate their own arguments. We have a lot of time and we're in person. Um, but if we're if we're pressed for time a little bit, or you know we're doing it remotely, and we're feeling like the teachers might need a little more scaffolding to to be successful in their moot, then we give them the arguments already written for them. So um, so being able to download them and manipulate them um, is really beneficial too. Jen, have you been following in the chat? Is there anything that I'm missing? I think you're getting the good stuff, yeah. I think one one thing to sort of plug when it comes to moots, um, when we do PDs, uh, we like to invite outside resource people to to join uh, the the moot court preparation, um, and then to stick around if they have the opportunity to to watch the simulation. But to have lawyers and judges actually train. Uh, students in, you know, developing arguments and how to apply precedents and things like that. And, and certainly the pandemic has been uh, good in a sense for, for folks from around the country, experts from around the country to be able to kind of beam into classrooms. Um, I think that hopefully something like that will sort of continue um, even beyond all this. I have to call attention to one comment, which I think is brilliant. Asking students to review their school handbook for constitutional mm -hmm. infringements is always fun. <laughs> um, certainly, uh, sometimes too, when you're teaching students about West Virginia v. Barnett, you find out that some of your colleagues aren't really um, following West Virginia v. Barnett. Um, so certainly within the school is, uh, is interesting for sure. And if you're interested in doing a, a mini moot, we have uh, 
three instructional videos on uh, Street Law's YouTube channel. You can also find them in the store. Um, but if you've never done a mini moot before and you want to try it, uh, we have about a five minute video on how you might do a mini moot and kind of what it looks like that might be uh, useful. Great. Um, yeah, there, so there, have there are lots of things in the chat. Make sure that you're looking about different ways to organize um, moots. People talking about using, you know, the whole full moot with, with nine justices, people using triads where they split their kids up and there was one justice and one petitioner, one attorney for petitioner and respondent. Um, there are all sorts of different ways that you can do it. I think we've done almost every every kind of one. Sometimes um, it works really well to have groups of six because that way you have um, you have partners. So if you have a student who's maybe not as um, it, it maybe isn't as um, confident with the material, they're they're not feeling like they're really put on the spot, um, and so that can be helpful as well. Particularly if it's a, a more complicated case, maybe one one. One partner can handle the um, the original initial argument, and the other partner can handle the rebuttal. Okay, Jen, is it time to move on? I think it is. So these were our webinar series objectives, um, and um, hopefully we can agree that um, with the things that we did today, you would be able to use stu student-centered strategies to teach Tinker v. Des Moines, and um, and um, certainly you're you're got sort of half of the way to being able to draw connections between Tinker and Mahanoy. So people are already probably thinking that. Um, these are our upcoming webinars. So um, the webinar next week will be largely the same as the first hour of this webinar um, for your students. Uh, we don't do a lot of direct to student webinars, I'm gonna be honest, um, but when we have, they're really exciting and um, we will definitely record this one. So if it's something that you would like to do, but um, you know your students can't attend in the evening, we understand that. Um, it's a challenge to come up with a time to um, hit students on, you know, in all of the time zones. Um, so, uh, so it might work best to use it re in record after it's recorded. Um, we'll have a, a webinar very similar to this one, but with some other methods and, of course, with other guests. So I did add our guest is confirmed for the teaching Tinker, I mean, for the teaching Mahanoy, and that is um, Bob Corn Revere. He is a First Amendment expert. He's a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, which is a big DC constitutional law firm. And he is the, um, he is the attorney who is authoring the amicus brief for the Tinkers. So if there's anyone who can draw a connection for us between Tinker and uh, Mahanoy, it's gonna be um, Mr. Corn Revere. So we're really excited to have him. We're still finalizing the expert for the student Mahano or Mahanoy VBL, um, webinar so that will we'll be able to announce that soon. So we Jen mentioned earlier that we have literally hundreds of case summaries in all kinds of cases. Um, we have the 15 require, required AP GoPo cases um, all together so you can download those individually or you can download them just in one um, one document. It's a big document. I think it's 60 pages or something. but um, but we had um, requests from teachers after the 15 after we released the 15 cases um, to be able to do it that way. So you have your choice um, how you want to do that. Um, we have lots of lessons on all sorts of things. There are 14th Amendment equal protection lessons. There are gerrymandering and redistricting lessons. There are lessons about um, the amendment process um, could go on for forever. Um, we have a, a bunch of instructional videos. These are fairly new. So if you haven't looked at our website lately, um, you might not be familiar with these. But we have um, videos on mini, how to do mini moot courts, how to do deliberations, how to do um, 
take a stand type continuum activities. And then the other one is called facilitator tips. You all are teachers, you probably don't need that. That's actually more for um, our legal partners and our community partners who, um, who don't have the teaching chops that you do. So you probably wanna skip that one. <laughs> uh, we have mock trials and, um, and then lots of del deliberations. Jen, do you want to talk about the store? You're better at this than me. Sure. I don't know if I'm better, but I'm happy to. Um, so yes, we call it a store. Um, no, you won't have to pay for anything. It will, however, some to some people, make it look like you're about to have to pay. So when you put things into your cart, it's going to ask you to check out. Um, and when you check out, it's going to ask you what your billing address is. Um, and then eventually, when you get down to the payment section, it will say payments not required. You'll see that zero dollars, you'll hit place order, and then it will pop up um, that you can download those materials. We'd suggest uh, creating an account just because it streamlines this process and makes it a lot easier. Okay, so landmarkcases.org, um, we just had a grant from the Supreme Court Historical Society who are our partners in landmarkcases.org to redo the whole thing. It had been done in 2002, it really needed a complete overhaul. We touched every single piece of text, every single activity. Um, we had 10 fantastic um, teacher authors working with us, helping us to, um, to uh, revise these materials. We added three new cases, um, Angle v. Vitale on school prayer and Shank v. U.S. on free speech. Those are both AP required cases and Obergefell v. Hodges, um, which isn't an AP case, but should be. Um, that's my own editorial opinion, not the opinion of street law um, on, marriage, on marriage equality. Um, so the biggest thing, the biggest change is that there's now a student facing view and a teacher facing view. And we, we made this shift honestly after the pandemic hit because this was very much a teacher facing um, website before where teachers would go and get materials that they would then, you know, like Xerox and hand out to their students. But we realized that there was a need for teachers to be able to send their students directly to the website to do some activities depending on what their teaching situation was. Um, another big change was every case now has a high school and a middle school case summary before the case summaries um, didn't exist and on, on landmark cases anyway. Um, and um, they and we have now um, Supreme Court case packs for um, selected cases for high school and middle schools that use primary source activities, Library of Congress type primary source activities. And there is a glossary for the whole thing. So um, students can go to the glossary to look up any terms they don't know. Yeah, so this is what it looks like when you get there. These are the 20 cases. They are not necessarily the AP required cases because this predated that um, redesign by quite some, quite a bit. Um, but you will see a lot of overlap there if you teach those. And then there are just some really fascinating cases as well. This is what the Tinker page looks like. If you go to the Tinker page, there'll be an overview. And then you can see all of the activities that are there for Tinker, including um, the judicial, active, judicial opinion writing activity for Morse v. Frederick that we talked about. Um, so this is the kind of thing. There is a mini moot activity already done for you for Tinker. So if you're thinking about mooting Tinker, don't recreate the wheel, go right there and all that information is gonna be there for you. Um, a great way to follow us and see what we're up to and what we're doing, like these kinds of webinars, is to follow us on social media. Um, and so that's where you can find us. We're Street Law Inc. You can, you're going to find some other really interesting things if you just search for Street Law. So I, I would suggest Street Law Inc. Um, so Jen is probably already, or she will drop the link um, to this, or I can do it. Um, if you want to get our educator e-newsletter and updates, um, so they come out periodically, and either when we have big news or um, you know just sort of on, on a regular basis as well. So that's another good way to to keep up with us. So there's a there's a URL there. You can also just scan that um, QR code or you can go to our website and fill it out at the bottom of the website. 
Okay, so um, you are all the very first to hear that we are definitely having our Supreme Court Summer Institute this summer virtually. Um, and so it will be during the same weeks that we've been adver advertising, June 17th through 22 or June 24th through 29, except the Sundays, we're going to take a break on the Sunday to, you know, not be in front of a screen. Um, on, they will be, um, the required sessions will be from one to five um, East Coast time, so Eastern Standard Time. Um, and we are going to extend the application deadline to April 1st um, to let people adjust to that. Um, if you've already applied, you'll get a chance to decide whether or not you want to keep your application in the pool or you want to defer your application to 2022. Um, we will, I will drop our emails. So um, our jobs are to help you find the materials that you're looking for. So please feel free to reach out to um, either me or Jen and um, let us know what you need. Um, it's really great for us to know what what kinds of materials teachers are looking for because there are times where we have opportunities to, um, to be able to do that. And we, we're certainly happy to point you in the right direction to the materials that we already have. Thank you very much for giving um, two hours of your midweek evening. That is, that is a, a big sacrifice and we, we certainly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everybody. Hope to see you. Um, and, and please feel free to, to come to the student web, uh, facing webinars. They're as much for you as they are for your students. Hope to see you at a, another one of these student speech webinar series.